And I want to pose that this may not be a pure tragedy, but instead could actually be an opportunity for the left, for the worker, to seize the day. I know this is sacrilege. I know it might be some kind of Stockholm syndrome taking its effect. I'm not saying that a Trump presidency is a new normal. Far from it. This is an abnormal. This is not normal. But it may also portend an opportunity, an opening for us to advance our agenda, even if people don't know it's our agenda. In other words, the red state that we're now in may actually provide an opening for the workers' economy, for a bottom-up economic transformation of unprecedented magnitude. The only thing we may have to reckon with is, what if the right gets the credit for it? Is that okay? What if they get credit for what's about to happen? So I understand this is an awful thing that happened, right? Awful thing. And I see the kids, I see my my comrades, my, my, my fellows in the street marching, shouting things at Trump Tower. This is not our president and all that. And, and I, I, part of me understands that and, and cheers them on. But part of me feels like this is the wrong tack. This is the wrong approach to this situation. It may not be time to whine and scream and be so upset about this, but rather to seize the moment of opportunity. I mean, I don't feel Trump won any more than the left lost. And this was a loss 50 years in the making. You know, the only invitation I got to participate in the Hillary Clinton campaign was an email inviting me to a fundraiser where I could meet Chelsea Clinton if I paid $1,000. I could get a picture with Chelsea Clinton if I paid $2,000. And I could sit in a tent and watch Chelsea Clinton speak if I paid $500. That's the invitation to participate <laughs> in a new government, in a, in in democratic politics that's the invitation that's not an invitation at all that's a restatement of the pay to play philosophy that has plagued the democratic party for many years now and there have been opportunities for that party for the left to accept our participation the world trade organization protests the wto protests of seattle should have been a wake-up call to the left to say oh my gosh there's energy there's workers, there's young people, they're ready. Were we invited? No. We had the Occupy movement, which Obama ignored. This was the president th that told us we are the thing, we are the change we've been waiting for, who did not invite us into his organization. He didn't invite us to participate. He bailed out the banks, but he didn't invite us. He didn't send out PDFs to all the small towns in America and teach us how to do local currencies, how to create favor banks, how to do local economic development. No. He bailed out the banks and expected them to then lend money to companies who would then build factories, who would then hire us as employees. That's not promoting labor. That's promoting a certain kind of funded employment. The Bernie Sanders happened. And Bernie Sanders, we saw. Bernie Sanders was intentionally rejected by the Democratic Party because it wasn't his turn, because he wasn't in the establishment. No, Hillary was. Hillary, a child of Goldwater, who converted after that to become a Democrat. You know, Hillary Clinton and a Democratic Party that seems more in line with the philosophy of the, you know, the CIA-sponsored globalism in Europe and America than the abandoned workers of America. The workers who were abandoned in the 1968 uh, Chicago Democratic Convention, the the black and and Hispanic and female workers who were rejected by the labor unions in the 1960s and 70s. This is not a party of the worker. So how are we supposed to expect the workers to feel that this is the party that's answering to them? No. And then the net comes, right? The net came. And the net is really good at disrupting things, but really bad at allowing for follow through. So we get Arab Spring, this terrifically disruptive act against an exploitative regime, but there was no way for people to then organize afterwards or occupy. It was great for disrupting, but really bad for rebuilding. 
And we end up with a Democratic Party that functions really like a platform monopoly. Either you're with the machine or you're against it. And there were a whole lot of disenfranchised groups who were not really finding solidarity in the party. At the very best, what the the left did and left academics, which I'm now learning a lot about as a university professor and um, leftward foundations and funding entities, they're really happy to fund intersectional studies, to fund identity politics, where you get to think about yourself as a particular race and gender and sexual orientation and state and class, but you don't find the solidarity with others. In other words, we are funded to think of ourselves as individuals rather than as part of a labor class. So the same thing that neoliberalism does through Facebook and Twitter, where they use algorithms to uh, individuate us and to atomize us, you know, the supposedly well-meaning left was doing by promoting this highly individualistic version of cultural identity. And you're not allowed to dissent. You know, the minute you start dissenting, the minute you start saying anything, even what I'm saying now, if I didn't have tenure, could be trouble. The digital media environment then also brings us the counterforce to all of this globalism. The digital environment is about discrete entities, where the television environment was about the whole globe. You know, we watch stuff on satellite, we watch the Olympics, the moon landing, we see Reagan, the television president, saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. In the internet era, in a digital media environment, we see the opposite. Everything is discrete. Everything is separate. We each have our own filter bubble. And we get Donald Trump saying, let's build a wall. It's all about divisions, us or them. The Trump movement, as a digital movement, won't really be any more successful at finding its ballast than any other digital rebellion or digital disruption that's happened. The powers that be are going to swoop into the vacuum and take over. Trump is not a man of principle, not a man of ideas. He's more like a, 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 like a Charlie Sheen. He jumped into the standing wave of culture and then embodied it. And he will do pretty much whatever the last person he's been with says, because he's an improviser. He's in the room. He's just trying to please whoever is there. And I think we have to be there. I don't think we should just be shouting at his building. I think we have to insinuate ourselves into what's actually happening there. I know this is insane to say this. I know, I get this. I know it's dangerous and you can hate me and hate the show, whatever, after this. But as a thought experiment, just to try it on, what if we use this opportunity to go local and to enact the circular economic solutions that we've been fighting for all along. If the left is going to resist local bottom-up business, local enterprise, sustainable, resilient, local economic activity without top-down funding, then maybe the right will be the environment in which to make this stuff happen. Now, Donald Trump put up a website called greatagain.com. Gov. And on that website, he is inviting anyone in America to apply to take one of the 4,000 jobs he has to fill in his administration because he doesn't have any people. He doesn't have an organization. So he is saying, hey, America, come apply to make America great again. And there's a website. You go, you go to greatagain.gov and look at what's there. You click on apply and it's easy. You Yeah, paste in a resume, you click from a bunch of menus as to what jobs you want, and hit send, and let's see. So what if we, the entire team human audience, what if the several thousand of us who are, you know, regular participants in this show, what if we all go to greatagain.gov and apply for positions in Trump's administration? It's an open invitation, so why not take it? Obama never invited us to do this. The Hillary campaign never invited me to do anything but fight for her campaign. You know, the street 
tantrum is fine to get out your angst, but it doesn't prove anything except that we are entitled. We feel entitled to the government that's going to serve us better rather than actually participating in the government we want. Now, I think it's time to step up, look at where the game is right now, without worrying about the past. Look at where we are right now and think, how can we best enact the government that we want? You know, and what if, worst case, what if it worked? What if it actually worked? I mean, I get it. I get Trump is, there's no nice way of saying it. Trump is a fascist, okay? He, he is fascist and he's a bully and he's mean. But fascism often comes, you know, the, the early fascism anyway, uh, comes as a, a reaction to to things that, that they don't fully understand or that aren't quite working out so well. I mean, Belloc and Chesterton, who were the, the English intellectuals that brought us the whole notion of distributism, the economic model that we've all been talking about with platform cooperatives and worker owned this and that. Those guys were proto-slight fascists. I mean, had they been allowed to go fully in their direction, these guys who were talking about the commons and local economics were actually uh, much more fascist-leaning than they were than they were communist. And I get that Trump is mean and and often comes off and and does bullying strange things. And his people, I mean, my God, I know we're afraid of them, but. The media also shamed Trump's supporters into hiding. I mean, look back at the tapes. Look at the way that they were described. Look at the way that they were talked about. Yeah, there were people here and there who would do bad things at Trump campaigns and it looked all crazy, but there was also real pain and some of them were articulating something genuine. In some cases, they were the very workers that had been alienated by a global elite leftist shadow of the former Democratic Party. So when we polarize, when we protest against them, I feel it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't think we need to be apocalyptic about this. I don't think that choosing to participate in government now represents some kind of collaboration with the Nazis. These are not Nazis. Right? They're not, at least not yet. Leave them alone and who knows? Participate and we stand a chance of actually steering this ship. Now, I remember I was, um, I started a, uh, a Jewish kind of a counterculture movement called Reboot. Oh, gosh, maybe a decade ago. And the guy who funded it, um, this old big Jewish philanthropist, he was having some second thoughts about the direction that this whole movement was going. It seemed a bit too open source for him. And I remember asking him, I said, how would you feel if, thanks to your money, thanks to your, your uh, funding, how would you feel if everybody in the world was practicing Judaism? They were all, you know, they, everyone was, was doing Sabbath, everyone was getting bar mitzvah, everyone was following all of the ethics, all of the principles, all the rules of Judaism. Only no one knew it was called Judaism. How would you feel about that? Would that be okay? And he said, absolutely not. And that's when I realized he didn't really care, right? He cared more about the name. He cared more about Judaism getting the credit for global ethics and equality rather than it actually happening. You know, so I'm asking you, which do you want? Do you want to try to enact global justice and especially economic justice for the worker? Or are you just dead set on keeping credit? Like, this is the question, I guess. Are you okay with everything we want to have happen, happening, but the right getting credit for it? But Donald Trump getting credit for it? At this point, I think things are so dire, I don't care who gets credit for it. I just want to be able to make change. I figure, best case, we get in this administration, we can actually set policy and steer this thing where we want it to. Worst case, if it really turns into a fascist, horrible, apocalyptic uh, administration, then at least we can play the role of Schindler. At least we can monkey wrench the thing from the inside and try to slow down the engines until we can get someone more sane in office. I, I encourage you at least do this thought experiment with me. Think about whether you want to apply 
whether we should all apply, thousands of us, apply to be in that administration. Worst case, if he says no, at least we have proof that his invitation wasn't valid and we can continue working from the outside as we always have.